In 2020, Republican Re- Representative Nancy Mace of the South Carolina's 1st Congressional District edged out Democratic incumbent Representative Joe Cunningham, who had been the first Democrat to flip a House seat in South Carolina in 30 years. Mace won by just 5,400 votes, or about 1%. And two years ago, following redistricting, Mace won re-election by 14%. Since then, Mace was critical of Trump following the January 6, 2021 MAGA attack on the U.S. Capitol. But she's endorsed Trump, despite the many criminal charges against him and his conviction for sexually abusing writer E. Jean Carroll in the 1990s. Now, forward-thinking business executive Michael B. Moore is one of the two Democrats running in the June 11 South Carolina primary for the chance to oppose Mace in November. His opponent in the primary is attorney Mac DeFord, whose interview on this podcast is now streaming. We're pleased to have Michael Moore with us on the Lean to the Left podcast, but before we get to that, I need to urge you guys to go visit podcast.leantotheleft.net, where you'll find thumbnails and links to all of our episodes. You can subscribe there, too. And don't forget to give us a rating wherever you listen. Five stars would be super, super cool. Now, Michael, sorry for the commercial, but welcome to our show. Absolutely. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Hey, you come from a long line of pioneering public servants, including your great-grandfather, Civil War hero and Reconstruction-era congressman, Robert Smalls. In 1862, Smalls commandeered a Confederate ship in Charleston in Charleston Harbor, carrying his family and 15 other enslaved people to freedom. He went on to become one of the first African-Americans ever to serve in Congress. And now you're seeking the same House seat held by your great-grandfather almost 150 years ago. That's quite a legacy, Michael. Now, can you give us a quick summary of your background and why it qualifies you to serve in Congress? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. I'll start with saying I'm a business guy. I've had an opportunity to run companies and organizations over the last 25, 30 years. Back in the late 90s, I was president of a technology company that really was a pioneer in creating the first generation of what we all now ubiquitously know as social media software uh, sites. Uh, And then a bit after that, I was president CEO of a food company that was originally based in uh, Columbus, Ohio, that we moved to South Carolina and brought jobs and opportunity here to South Carolina. And then back in 2015, former Charleston Mayor Joe Riley asked me to be the founding president and CEO of the International African American Museum, which is probably one of the most consequential public institutions in the region, perhaps the country. Uh, and uh, and so that's one side of me is this sort of business uh, kind of side that's uh, given me an opportunity to to lead professionally. But uh, as mentioned. You mentioned my great grandfather. Uh, I, I actually, if I'm elected, I'll be the fourth in the last five generations of people in my family from South Carolina to serve in elected office. I come from a long line of folks, not just my great grandfather, but my great grandfather uh, was elected to the General Assembly uh, during Reconstruction. I have a cousin from Columbia, Judge Harold Boulware, who was on the team with Thurgood Marshall that won the famous segregation case, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And then, excuse me, I grew up with my grandfather, uh, who was started off as just a kind of country farmer in Chester, but got some education, ended up being a college professor, was very active in the civil rights movement, and was for 12 years on the city council in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, he would take me to city council meetings as a kid. And I think he is the one who really activated this sense uh, of service and the good that one can do by contributing to your community and to those around you. And while this is my first foray into politics, it's been around me and, uh, and something that has certainly guided me. I got a political science degree from Syracuse University as undergrad. I got an MBA from Duke University. And like even those degrees combine 
my my interests. I, I think why am I uh, qualified to be in Congress? First of all, I think I, I bring the appropriate attitude, temperament. Uh, I, I'm a very kind of no-nonsense, common-sense guy. I talk a lot of, in my various goings about low country common sense. I just want to get something done. I talk to people just about every day who really have a need for government to work and to work for them. Government works great if you're in the 1%. Yeah. Average working folks need for it to work for them too. And they need to have somebody in Washington who has their back. And, and I certainly have done that. But even in my career, I've done business on four continents. I have engaged with foreign heads of state. Charleston Business Magazine named me one of the most influential people in the region. The city of Charleston named a day after me. I've just been involved in a lot of things. And I've, I've had real accomplishments. city of Charleston named a day after you? You had a, a day named after me, yeah. Why? Why? What did you do? I was the, the president, the founding president and CEO of the International African American Museum. And okay. that project, as it completed, I think... Uh, and as I was moving on, I had committed to that project to get them through groundbreaking. And once I did that, I think as a part of the celebration of, of our efforts, uh, Mayor Tecklenburg at the time uh, gave me a day. Wow. How about that? <laughs> Maybe one of these days you'll have one of these bridges around here named after you. Uh, Every time I go across a bridge, it has somebody's name on it. My wife always goes, what the hell did he do or she do to usually it's a he <laughs> usually it's a he uh, yeah. to, to, to get that bridge named after him yeah. it, it might even be just a little culvert <laughs> you know, but the, seems like everything's named after somebody in south carolina yeah, i agree <laughs> anyway let's talk a little bit about this federal court ruling about the south carolina elections ordering that um the primary be held under a map that's already been deemed to be unconstitutional and discriminatory against black voters. And it was the same three judge panel that found that the state used race as a proxy for partisan affiliation, which is a violation of the 14th amendment of the constitution. Now, what are your thoughts about that, Michael? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a tragedy. Look, um, particularly since I'm on, leaning to the left podcast, not leaning to the right podcast. I feel safe in saying that Republicans know that they are they are bad on the demographics. They are bad on the issues. And so they've got to play games and they've got to lie, cheat and steal, frankly, to to try to hang on to power. On October 11th, which was the day that the oral arguments for the gerrymandering case for our district first began, the arguments began. I was on the steps of the Supreme Court, I had an opportunity to speak in a, a, a rally. And I, I, I talked about the fact that uh, no longer are we in a world, in a country where we can just passively take for granted the kind of democracy that we grew up with. I think January 6th, a few years ago, showed us that this is a new a new time. And I, I think it's a, I think all, all in all, it's a tragedy. 30,000 voters, uh, many of whom were just like me. I'm an African-American voter in the first congressional district. And I had my political voice muted by having those 30,000 uh, voters uh, exiled from the district, so to speak. I, I engaged with the issue from a number of different vantage points. As a candidate, I, I care about, obviously, the composition of our district. I care that now there are people just miles away from me who are now not in my district, and, and that's bizarre. But I also, from a historical standpoint, Robert Smalls, uh, 140 some years ago, was gerrymandered out of the district. And it just, South Carolina has come a long way, but on this particular issue, we're still seeing gerrymandering and seeing the use of tools to deny people political voice. And uh, I think it's I think it's embarrassing. I think South Carolina is better than that or should be better than that. And and I'm out talking to folks and, and looking to represent everyone in the district. And I hope justice ultimately will prevail. I will just say, lastly, the lower courts, basically their hand in making the decision to use the lines that we have now 
their, their hands were forced because the Supreme Court is basically dragging their heels on this. They know what they've decided. They know what they're going to do, but they don't, it feels like they're just putting their hand on the scale a little bit, influencing this particular race. And again, I think that's disappointing. Okay. What are your thoughts? Of, you mentioned January 6th in, in, a couple of minutes ago. What are your thoughts about Congresswoman May supporting Trump and criticizing him for the January 6th insurrection? I think a lot of people in the district want to know who is the real Nancy Mace. Is it the one who critiqued Trump or is it the one who went out and sought his endorsement and won his endorsement? Is it the one who said that she was pro-woman and supported in some to some degree women's reproductive freedom or is it the one who was the co-sponsor of a six-week abortion ban and sponsored a bill against IVF is it the one who voted against the infrastructure bill or is it the one who shows up when the bacon so to speak comes to the district back to the district and wants to try to take credit of it so I think that's part of the problem with Nancy Mace is that I, I it doesn't feel like there's uh, much integrity to her position. She says what she feels like she needs to say at the moment to uh, appease whatever political uh, group she's in front of. So I, I think it's a problem. Yeah. Okay. So what would be your your uh, top priorities, Michael, if you're elected? Coming from a business background, I think the economy um, is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. I, I believe that there are a lot of needs. People have a lot of needs, but I think at the core, if a family, someone family has a good job with good benefits to take care of their family, and then ultimately that allows them to retire with dignity, I think that's the start. So I spend a lot of time focusing on how do we create a more inclusive economy? How do we help people better take advantage of their skills, their hard work to take care of their families? I think healthcare is an enormous problem. I think first, most acute is the issue with women's reproductive freedom and codifying Roe v. Wade and ensuring that women have the rights to make decisions about their own bodies. But even broader than that, medical debt is the number one cause of bankruptcy in America. There are 110 million Americans who are mired down by healthcare debt. And we just have to create uh, a more balanced system Someone pointed out to me uh, recently, when you go to New York City, the tallest buildings are the insurance companies. And <laughs> I think they're an enormous the problem. Never thought of that. Yeah. Lots of issues. I think the environment, they don't call us down here, the low country, for no reason. I think we've got to really get serious. And we've got to, here in the district, we've got to take some ownership of trying to contribute to the solution to our environment. It's a much broader problem, obviously, than the low country, but I think we can be leaders in that. And then I would just say last two issues, because I know we got limited time, but education is an enormous challenge in this country. South Carolina ranks toward the bottom of the states in public education. My great-grandfather wrote the legislation to create the public school system in South Carolina, which was the first uh, public school system in the way that we know them now in the entire country. And I know he would be rolling in his grave. There's solid research that shows that lifetime earnings, the accumulation of all someone earns is directly connected to uh, education. And we just have to, you know, stop fooling around banning books and we've got to let teachers teach. We've got to compensate teachers in appropriate ways. I come from a family. My wife is a teacher. She teaches special needs children. Both my parents were teachers. Three of my four grandparents were teachers. I understand from a, a number of different vantage points the power that the advantage that can come from having a great education. So we've got to get serious. And then I would just say, as a father, I've got four sons. I've got a, a beautiful nine-month-old granddaughter. It always breaks my heart when I say that the number one cause of death among our children in this country is gun violence. And look, we are making a value judgment as a nation. We are saying that it's more important that we adhere not just to the Second Amendment, but to the NRA's rather perverted interpretation of the Second Amendment than it is to care for our communities and to care for our, our children. And so I would say there are a whole host of really common sense reforms, by the way, that the vast majority of Americans already agree to, that we just need to get behind. We need to have people in Washington who will will support those things. So a lot of issues, but but those are those are a few. We need to have people in Washington who have the courage to 
address some of these issues like guns, for example. Because Absolutely. it seems to me that uh, despite all these horrible shootings that take place in schools and shopping centers and churches, it's because people have unfettered access to firearms. And instead of doing anything to turn that around, the states are making it easier for people to have weapons and weapons of mass destruction. It's really interesting. I, I flew to another state, had to rent a car. And as I was renting the car, I saw this big sign that says, you've got to be 25, you've got to have a good driving record, and you've got to have good credit to be able to rent a car from that particular place. You can, as that's just to rent a car. You yeah. can, 18-year-old, you can get a assault rifle with a high-capacity magazine with no training, with no nothing, and uh, and it just doesn't make any sense. It's illogical, and, and I think we need to do, we can do better, we need to do better. Okay. So uh, your district one is dependent on tourism. It's sensitive sure. to climate issues and in need of affordable housing. It's comprised of varied communities with different needs. If elected, how would you deal with those issues and meet those varied needs? I think we've got to first have someone um, who cares about those needs. Nancy Mace, uh, likely you heard the story that uh, leaked documents from her campaign um, say that she calls herself National Nancy and that she's got a quota on uh, her staff getting her on national news, not South Carolina news, not first district news, national news. I think with all her antics and everything else, I think it's pretty clear that she's actually more interested in either getting a a role in, God forbid, the next Trump administration or getting a gig on Fox News or who knows. But her, it's clear her interests are not here in the first congressional district. So I think having somebody who cares about the district, who cares about the people, look, my ancestors got here in the early to mid 1790s and have been here ever since. My I mentioned Robert Smalls, he got in office in 1868 and I've had multiple generations of people serve. It is the highest and greatest aspiration in my life to serve the people here in the first congressional district and to become a representative who's got their back. So that's the the, the high level. And then I think we've got to dive into the issues. I've already contributed to tourism as the founding president and CEO of the International African American Museum. I was able to step across uh, party lines and raise money and get this institution up and going. And it's a powerful, again, one of the most, I think, consequential public institutions in the state. And I, I will continue to um, support the creation of those kinds of things. We just need to create a, a sensible uh, approach to all these issues. Um, development is great, but it's got to be balanced by human issues. Um, people need to be able to live in the communities that they work. We need to not just continue to gentrify our communities in search of, of the dollar. And so I would work with uh, local communities. And in particular, I'll mention, I think the Gullah Geechee community along the coastlines is particularly vulnerable along this. They've got extraordinarily valuable land that often has been in their families for 150 plus years since Reconstruction, since the end of the Civil War, but are quickly and systematically being pushed off their lands. And I think we need to do something to protect to protect their properties. But I think the biggest thing is, again, having a representative who's engaged with the people, engaged with the local issues, and who will be there to fight for all these things. I know, I'm sure that in your district, District 1 in South Carolina, that you've got plenty of Social Security and Medicare recipients. Is that a, a good assumption? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, all right. So what do you think about what the Republicans and Trump keep talking about, cutting benefits and raising the retirement age and all of that? I think, as our current president would say, I think that's malarkey. Yeah. I know. I Look, first of all, I disagree with how Republicans talk about entitlements. Somehow, if a government program for people, it's given this epithet that it's an entitlement, but we can give corporations all kind of subsidies and the like, and that's perfectly fine. Yeah. E even that aside, Social Security is not an entitlement in any kind. It's an earned benefit. Every American pays into that system from their fir very first check when they're 14, 15, 16 years old. Yep. And I believe it's a promise that that every paycheck doubles down, doubles and triples down on. And so I think we've got to support Social Security. I think we've got to support Medicare. 
Um, and I and I've got a number of ideas about how we can do that, but absolutely under no circumstances should we consider uh, cutting Social Security. I don't even believe in increasing the the age that you can start drawing. I think there's all kinds of things. Congress has been stealing from the Social Security Trust Fund for generations. That's why if there's a problem, that's where it comes from. And I think we just need to solve that challenge in a creative way that allows folks to maintain their benefits and and that will make it healthy. But privatizing it or cutting it, cutting benefits, I totally disagree with. Okay. Now, you mentioned a little while ago abortion and reproductive rights, but I'd like you to expand on that if you could. Yeah, I think we'd have a different perspective on this if all of a sudden the government were trying to mandate vasectomies for men or something like that. I think we'd think about this a little bit differently about the government. <laughs> I, I think you're probably right there. <laughs> um, so, no, I, I just think it, I think the government has absolutely no role in getting between a woman and her physician on around her health matters. I, I am just appalled. I saw the statistic that in those states that outlawed uh, abortion, there were 60,000 collectively, 60,000 pregnancies that arose from rape or incest or things like that. So 60,000 women, girls and women, are being forced to take pregnancies to term because their states have outlawed it. I just think it's horrendous. Um, and further, you know, there's been talk that next up is contraception and they've already talked about IVF. I, I just I just think we need to jump back into the 21st century here and and women need to have the right to make decisions about their body. But I will also tell you this. I go my support for women goes further than just women's reproductive freedom. I support the Equal Rights Amendment. I support pay equity. I support the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, there are all kinds of research that says that societies that are healthy and they're doing well, they're thriving, in part are thriving because the women in those societies are well supported and are uh, protected. And I, just today, as a matter of fact, my uh, campaign announced a group of women came together and launched a Women for More group. And I just feel so grateful for their support and an active group of women who are going all around the district and uh, talking about the campaign and gathering other women uh, to join us. And so I feel grateful. Women are going to be a very important part of the election. And uh, and I feel grateful to have uh, that group behind me. Okay. Let's turn a little bit to the other hot button issue that the Republicans keep blasting Trump and, and the Democrats over, and that's immigration. What do you Where do you stand on generally on that issue? And what do you think should be done? Generally, I don't think the issue is particularly, it's not an honest issue. I think that Republicans, the fact that they had an opportunity to pass a bipartisan bill and chose not to, I think, reveals their true motivations and how political this is. Look, I think the other thing I would say is that if we just start thinking about the problem when someone is at our southern border, we've already lost the ball game. It's a hemispheric problem. We've got to think about hemispheric solutions. We've got to work with our partners, our neighbors to the south. And we've got to try to create situations where there is economic opportunity, where there's political stability. These people are coming here and, and risking their lives and risking their children's lives. They're not doing it on vacation. They're doing it because that's, in their minds, is the best alternative. And so I think if we are serious about this problem, A, we will uh, look at this and look at partnering with governments south of us around these problems. But I also think we've got to be honest that a lot of these folks are being lured here by businesses seeking to take advantage to exploit their labor without paying them a full wage, without giving them benefits, without the benefit of appropriate safety standards and the like. And so we, we just got to get honest about this challenge all the way around. The other thing I would say is Donald Trump in particular, but lots of his Republican minions always try to talk about the fact there are, are characterized uh, folks coming from the South of us as criminals, rapists and the like. The, the facts on this are clear. Uh, immigrants who come to this country are less likely, significantly less likely to commit crimes than people here. And it's just logical about that. If someone's here, particularly if they 
are here in an undocumented way, they're not going to do anything to call attention to themselves and to potentially get themselves booted. The other thing is, I think the fentanyl issue is a really serious issue. I think it deserves an extraordinary amount of attention, but it gets trivialized when the lie is perpetrated that immigrants are bringing fentanyl over the border. It's not immigrants, it's the Americans who are going down and getting fentanyl and bringing it over. And it's a dubious that the source of that fentanyl is coming from China as well. So I think all around, we just need to get honest about the, the challenge and we need to act in in sober and, and realistic kinds of ways. Yeah. How do you feel about the fact that there was a bipartisan bill, which the Democrats were not crazy about, but they supported and it made it partway through Congress. But then Donald Trump, oh, nobody, don't pass that. No, that's a win for Biden. Don't do it. And so the Republicans bailed and the bill failed. And now we're yeah, stuck. I think I, I think it it clearly betrays their real motivations that they are really political yeah, on this course. issue, using yeah. it as a political football to try to attack Biden. Uh, and they're not really serious. And I, frankly, I think Nancy Mace, we will hold her accountable on this particular issue. Yeah. Now, in, in, it occurred to me that you're running for Congress, a very red state. And so it's an uphill battle. There's just no yes. no way to cut, say it any other way. It is an uphill battle. And what they've done with redistricting in, in your district doesn't help. But I'm just wondering why it is that you're willing to take on this challenge against these odds and why you think it would be any different for you compared to those members of Congress who are now leaving because they're just frustrated with the fact that nothing can get accomplished. Great question. Look, we looked really hard at the district and whether we could win. I, I, I've got this legacy. I feel a deep calling to do this work, but I wasn't going to bang my head against the wall if there was no chance in us winning. Donald Trump won the district in the presidential campaign by like 52, 53 percent, 52 and some change percent. So it's not 60, it's not 70 percent. Beyond that, Joe Cunningham, when he lost by, as you mentioned, I think 5,400 votes, there were 73,000 uh, voters uh, of color who just weren't inspired to come to the polls. This last candidate, uh, Dr. Andrews, great candidate, um, if she had just gotten half of the voters of color, uh, both Latinos and African-Americans, she would have won, despite the gerrymander. I had an old coach who once told me to get different results, you got to do things differently. One of the things that we are doing, first of all, I've got an amazing team of people, the head of our team, the person who's in the role of campaign manager was the executive director of the Georgia Democratic Party when they flipped that state and won those Senate seats person driving our finance function was the finance director for Jamie Harrison when they raised $130 million in his Senate campaign, then jumped over to Georgia, raised over $100 million for Stacey Abrams um, in her race for governor. And the person who, you know, getting back to doing things differently on this particular question, we're going to build an amazingly uh, efficient and effective ground game. There hasn't really been a ground game down here in a while. And the person who was driving that for us came to us from the Obama uh, campaigns. One of the things that really distinguished Obama's victory was the fact that he had this really effective ground game. And the person who started with him down here in 2008 and then came back and led this state and a number of other, uh, you know, battleground states, uh, she is leading that effort for us. So we're going to get out the vote. We've already got people out canvassing and uh, calling folks. And, you know, we are going to inspire voters, you know, for us to win. You know, we've got to get out the African-American and Latino voter out and win 170,000 left-leaning women in the district who are pissed off yeah. about, obviously, about the whole reproductive freedom issue. And we're marshalling their efforts. Young people, we've already got a, a group of, we've got a campaign fellows program, like an internship. And we've already got 20 young people and we're just getting started. We're going to have an army of young people out connecting with other young people, talking to them about our campaign, about the issues. 
And look, we also think that Nikki Haley beating Donald Trump in the Republican presidential primary proved that there's probably an even larger universe of moderate Republicans who at least are not going to vote for anything MAGA. And that obviously includes Nancy Mason. Look, we think with my business background, with with all that I've accomplished and in, in the community, being on the board of the commerce and all the, those things, we think we're going to have a good shot at speaking to them in languages that make sense and attracting some of those folks. So we're feeling good. We've already raised money. Um, you know, we've raised money all around the country, 46 states. We've raised money because I think people are starting to sense that we're a campaign that can help pick up this seat and uh, and help put a Democrat in the speaker's chair. And we're going for it. OK, great. All right. So have you got anything else you'd like to add? No, just we are we're working hard for folks who might be interested. Our website is just my name, michaelbmore.com. Okay. Uh, we'd love to get people to to donate, to volunteer. There's lots of opportunities for folks to get involved and I'm okay. grateful for the opportunity to to visit with your your viewers and love to come back sometime. All right. Thank you very much and we we, we wish you well and you know what if you make it through, we'll have you on and at that at that time It'll be bigger stakes. <laughs> Sounds great. Look forward to it. Uh, all right. Thanks so much, uh, Michael. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed talking. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and you found it interesting and informative. Please visit on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that focus on progressive politics and the important social issues of our time. Now, our interview shows stream on Mondays with special episodes on Thursdays. And you can check out upcoming shows, guests, and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net. Subscribe to our audio version there and to our video shows here at YouTube. And follow us on social media, Facebook at Bob Gaddy and the Lean to the Left podcast. Now it's two. Bob Gaddy is one Facebook page. And the Lean to the Left podcast is a second Facebook page. Twitter at Lean to the Left One, Instagram at Lean to the Left One, TikTok at Lean to the Left, LinkedIn at Bob Gaddy, and YouTube at Lean to the Left. Now, I hope you'll support Lean to the Left as well so we can keep things going. Just click on the Donate tab at the top of the LeanToTheLeft.net homepage and contribute by buying me a cup of coffee. That'll really help and would be much, much, much appreciated. Now, this is Bob Gaddy signing off for Lean to the Left. Thanks for sharing your time with us.